to say that I am absolutely delighted to be in Miami. Well, I'm always delighted to be in Miami because I'm from Boston. But um, and it's always better weather here, especially in the winter. But I am especially uh, pleased to be here because I feel that Miami is a very special place, a special place for Soriano, a, 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 a place where Soriano, if you will, has come home, much like the prodigal son who goes and wanders to California and Boston and all these wonderful places. He comes home to the paternal embrace of the people who nurtured him and loved him and supported his art throughout his exile years here in Miami. So that is important to recognize. I think it's also important to recognize uh, that if Miami is the paternal embrace, then Cuba is the maternal embrace, where uh, he was born and raised, and he was educated, and where he came into his own as a very important concrete painter. So as we turn and we look at this gallery here, we see the result of all of that education, we see the result of everything that he was doing in the 50s before he left. So the 50s was a very important decade in Cuba because what you're looking at is a conversation really between abstraction in Latin America, in the United States, in Europe, and also specifically in Cuba. So organic abstraction hit Cuba in the early 50s. It began to wane by the mid 50s and this concrete or geometric abstraction is what resulted and really what came and took over at the end of the decade of the 50s. So our friend Rafael Soriano was a member of the Diez Pintores Concretos, so 10 concrete painters, and you can see his interpretation here on the walls. This uh, beautiful piece, Luthier Naga, and I'll just point it out, because it's so stunning, um, is from 1955, and is probably, you can see he's at the apex of his uh, career here in terms of painting geometric abstraction. So you see this beautiful luminosity, and you see the beauty of the forms that he puts together, and you can see textures in his work. So we're very happy that we have this. It was and did form part of a joint exhibition at the National Museum of Fine Arts in Havana. Uh, and it was a joint exposition, uh, exhibition between Rafael Soriano and the organic abstract artist, Agustin Cárdenas. And we have a small picture uh, at the, on the wall text of that exhibition that was showed at the National Museum of Fine Arts. So you can see that Rafael Soriano was, uh, at this time in 1955, he was in his mid-30s, and he was always sh already showing at the National Gallery. So he was already making a name for himself. He was already very prominent. And in 1959, he begins uh, to join his talents, his concrete talents, with other uh, abstract artists. And those artists became 10 concrete artists, Los Diez Pintores Concretos. This beautiful red painting at the back with the blue background, that shows you what he was doing in 1959. Now, as you all know, and I'm probably you know, preaching to the choir, 1959 is especially significant, especially for Cubans and Cuban Americans. So the revolution marches through in 1959, and it becomes, quite, it becomes politically quite a turbulent time. But what happens to these artists is maybe because of this turbulence, it is inspirational in many ways, and they begin to really produce outstanding works of art. By 1961, Fidel Castro, who had marched in on January 1st, 1959, begins to uh, look at the revolution, and he uh, reconsiders uh, the precepts of that revolution, where abstraction is no longer heralded and is in fact discouraged in terms of uh, painting. So social realism and the precepts which really embrace the communist movement then uh, begins to move that revolution to another aesthetic expression, which would be social realism. Many artists decided 
to leave because of that, because of the lack of freedom, Rafael Soriano was one of, of those artists. So um, his, his daughter has a wonderful anecdote that she talks, she remembers that her father told her that when he was approached by the government to paint palomas or doves, he said, no. And then they asked, por qué? Why? And he said, por qué no quiero? <laughs> so he was very fiercely independent. He wanted to paint his own way, his own vision. And as we step through the gallery, we're going to see what that vision ended up being. So please follow. As we move into this second uh, gallery, which is so exquisitely installed, I'm going to pause here next to these two beautiful paintings from the 1940s. Now, if you remember, the concrete abstract artists were painting in the decade of the 50s. And here we have two remarkably beautiful examples of how Soriano was painting in the previous decade. If you look at these two paintings, Flor a Contraluz, which is from 1943, and Musicos Tocando un Organo from 1949, we clearly see the reflection of uh, surrealism. Uh, on the far left, we see Flora Contraluz, which is an example of hybridity, very emblematic of the work of Wilfredo Lam. And we see here in Musicos Tocando un Organo, we see here the profusion of elements which is very typical of the Baroque period, which was brought to Latin America by the Cuban uh, painter, uh, excuse me, the Cuban intellect, Alejo Carpentier, who developed his own theory on lo real maravilloso, or what came to be known as magic realism. So this profusion of elements and this beautiful movement uh, is very emblematic of the Baroque period. So it's important to understand that our friend Rafael Soriano was schooled not only in the best school in Cuba, La Academia de San Alejandro, but also schooled by the best professors who had been in Europe, had been in Spain, had been in Italy, had been in France, and brought those dialectics and those conversations back to Cuba. And then they reinterpreted all of that European vocabulary, that <coughs> lexicon, in their own Cuban way. What happened with the first generation of Cuban artists is that they really were interested in looking at what was European and reinterpreting that in a Cuban way. So the first and second generations were exposed to that. The third generation, of course, since they everything else had been taken, they repudiated that and said, no, we want to do something completely different. We break with surrealism. We break with cubism. We break with all the isms. And we embrace abstraction. And now abstraction was transnational. It was happening throughout the world. And they wanted to jump on that cart and say, yes, we are tired of redefining ourselves as the first and second generation did in what is essentially Cuban. We want to join the universal conversation. So what happens to Soriano in 1962 when he decides to come to the United States is he breaks with abstraction because according to his own world words, the trauma was so severe that he could no longer paint just geometrics. He needed to find a new expression which would really be able to express, if you will, the deep emotions <coughs> and trauma that he felt in exile. When he returned to painting, he no longer painted just geometrics. He retrieved the surrealist imagery and synthesized that with the organic and the geometric. So these two beautiful paintings from 1970 show that after he's been in the United States a few years, he continues to play with geometrics, but those geometrics are extended and malleable and now incorporate organic forms, which was part of that conversation and discussion. So as you look around all of these walls here in this beautiful installation 
that the frost has done, you can see that the geometrics are alive and well, but now they're twisting, they're turning, and they're creating their own movement as he was trying to express what was twisting and turning inside of his emotional psyche. So we'll just continue. I'm gonna give you a quick tour, and you please must come back and appreciate it on your own terms. place to pause because I'm going to cover two different periods at the same time. So please come in. We'll be like uh, sardinas in lata, as we say, you know, sardines in a little tin can. So be very intimate here. Um, I wanted first to show off these beautiful paintings that you have uh, that I'm facing right now. This is part of his transition period, which uh, reminds me very much of either Roberto Mata, who liked to talk about inscapes or morphologies, and, and inscapes can be inscapes of the artist's psyche. So you can see kind of Las Alas del Viento, which is in the uh, middle, and then you can see Jardín Idílico, which is on the left, Idyllic Garden, which could be another Mata, it could, or it could be an Arsha Gorky a displaced kind of geographical garden. We're not sure where. It could be in space. It could be under the water. It could be the inner psyche. Um, and then on the right, we have El Manto, the road. And so through all of these, you can see where Soriano was and yet where he's going. He embraces this kind of organic abstraction and just lets these geometrics kind of flush out and move and become much more sensual and much more rounded. And it's important to remember that Soriano not only had a degree in painting and drawing uh, from the Academia, but he also had a second degree in sculpture and drawing. So these three dimensional forms that you see are, are definitely playing out. So as we look here on the left, it's a really interesting juxtaposition because we have Torso in Greece, so this is a torso, and then we have, uh, so this is a disembodied figure, right? And then we have a, uh, a portrait here. So these two are kind of show you where he's going in the 90s, right? So this is the 70s, and in the 80s to the 2000s, what he is able to do, he's actually able to resolve his tension between surrealism and abstraction by fusing both of those together. He decides that he's going to incorporate surrealist imagery that's been nurtured from early years, but sifted through many decades of suffering and struggle. And he's going to incorporate as well uh, this beautiful uh, surrealist imagery with that abstraction imagery. So these are two, believe it or not, some of my favorite paintings. Uh, Nicolas de Cusa, who was a Renaissance German theological uh, writer, uh, philosopher. Uh, I love this painting because it is so compelling and disturbing at the same time. And Edmund Burke from the 18th century actually wrote a definition about the difference between the beautiful and the sublime. And the beautiful is definitely analogous to pleasure, whereas the sublime goes beyond pleasure and incorporates terror and fear and, and pain. And as we look at this, we can see the portrait of a man who is both at the same time uh, compelling and yet disturbing, right? And what is going on and why is Soriano so fascinated by Nicolas de Cusa, this 15th century thinker? And it calls to mind once again eh, Roberto Mata, who painted The Unthinkable, which is one of his premier 50s paintings, where he's trying to use through architectural uh, uh, for, uh, iconography, if you will, blocks to kind of keep out the forbidden thought. And I think Soriano is trying to portray what thought and the thought process is. So he takes on a very important uh, uh, historical figure, 
but he tries to emphasize that what is happening in the brain and in the mind is really important. So this is an important piece to have, and it shows his mastery. If you follow around, we're just going to go right around. I've kind of told you everything about the 80s through the 20s, and you can see him as he evolves. I'm just going to pause here really quickly in front of this. This is, I, this is my favorite part about being a curator. and You get to see some of my favorites. Um, this is Dimension Enigmatica. And this is an early 90s piece from 94. And what you're seeing is this fusion, and you'll see this in all of the galleries. You see this fusion that I was talking about from the physical to the metaphysical. So he goes from being just a physical, three-dimensional painter of geometrics, and he enters this kind of transcendental state, this metaphysical state, where the spiritual really infuses his work. The luminosity really comes out at the viewer, compelling the viewer and welcoming the viewer to come in and actually transcend the figure itself and look beyond that figure into what would be the metaphysical. So I think one of the outstanding things that uh, Rafael Soriano does is he really is able to paint luminosity. He's able to juxtapose the darkness, the oniric quality, with this lightness, which is very emblematic of the Baroque, again, that chiaro oscuro, the dark and the light. But he does it in a way with colors. He doesn't just do it with black and white, he does it with colors. And so the same colors that we saw in the geometric room, that first room, with the luminosity in geometrics, he's able to do that equally proficiently here in an abstract way. So as you walk through this gallery, we're gonna circle back around, and please take a look at this kind of fusion and this luminosity that only Soriano is able to achieve. Soriano, along with the great painter's painters, Alejandro Andreos, who said, he contributed to our catalog. He said, much like Rembrandt or Velasquez, he is a painter's painter. So please enjoy his colors. because it's such a fabulous vista. Um, so you can see here the works of uh, Soriano from the 90s and the 2000s. We actually, he stopped painting in 2000 when he was a mere 80 years old. Um, but as you look around these walls and these walls, you can see that he is at the apex of his career. He's definitely, um, he gets better and better. So as you look around, imagine that Maestro Soriano is 70 years old and he's still painting with an exquisite control. He's still able to control the colors and to bring forth this luminosity. So it's amazing to me to think that at 70 years old, he can still manage the brush, the technical part of painting, as well as the creative part of painting. I think one of the exquisite things as you look around, you see this beautiful painting, uh, uh, Guardian, uh, this is uh, a dream painting right here from the 90s. Serena Imagen, and Serene Imagine, uh, which is one, of course, these are all my favorites, so what can I say? Um, and then Naturaleza Onirica, which is Oniric Life, and then this one is El Descanso del Héroe. These were all from the 90s. And I think what speaks to you 
speaks to me. You see these otherworldly fantastical forms. They could be in space. This could be straight out of Star Wars or some intergalactical uh, uh, production. So, uh, Alejandro Andreas, again, was very intimate, both as a, you know, as a professor, he was a student of uh, Soriano's and a lifelong friend. He has suggested that this could be a self-portrait of Soriano floating through space. Um, so he definitely reached into his own inner psyche and his own imagination to paint these paintings. He was a nocturnal painter, <coughs> according to his daughter, uh, Hortense Soriano, and according to his widow. And he would come home every night and he would paint. And I think that infuses these works of <coughs> art. Um, and over here we have Naturaleza Onirica, <coughs> which could be a play on uh, Naturaleza Muerta, which is still life, and this is Onirica, Oniric. Uh, life, and indeed, in some um, someone in Boston said, you know, this reminds me very much of a like a a Cezanne type piece of a still life. Um, and then over here, you see one of his magnificent paintings, Espejísimos de Agua. Uh, this is uh, water mirages, and as you look at it, you can definitely see. Well, he must have had a great sex life because it's very erotic. Um, but you can also see this fabulous kind of uh, journey that he's taking in his mind or his inner psyche. And it's so compelling. It makes you just want to dive right in. These blues and these purples and the shades of white here that we see um, are very, very Baroque in terms of the movement and the coloration. But um, it's also very unique. I look at this and I see this and I say, that's a Soriano. Interestingly enough, there have been a lot of fakes of the geometrics, but there are no fakes of this, okay? It's too hard to actually reproduce something like this. This is a master at the apex of his career. So we look at this work and we um, are just uh, fascinated and compelled by equal measure in what he is able to produce as a mature artist and as an artist who has come into his own. And the thing that I think is very compelling about uh, Maestro Soriano is that he never belabored his, his, uh, his past. He never looked back with regret. He accepted what fate had given him. But he also seemed to transcend that fate by painting. And he shows us what the whole universal experience is like, what it's like to love, what it's like to lose, what it's like <laughs> to pick yourself up, and what it's like to go inward for sustenance in order to uh, be able to transcend whatever those obstacles may be. So I think in the end, uh, Soriano has a lot of life lessons for us all, not only in painting, but perhaps in, in uh, transcending that and, and being you know, somewhat a spiritual guide. He was a very spiritual man. And I think we're all the luckier for it to have him. So uh, to my right, I'm just going to let you go. These are some of his later pastels that he did on paper and crayons. But I think I will end my tour here so that you're able to actually move in many directions. There are some great sight lines. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh.